Okay, it is exactly two o'clock here in the afternoon in Finland. Uh, welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, good afternoon if you're in, in Europe and good morning to those of us joining uh, from the, the North American side. Uh, my name is Julie Oleski. I'm a customer success specialist here at Inclus, and I'll be facilitating our webinar today. Today, you can expect us to cover a range of topics related to the changing landscape of risk management, including industry outlooks, agility versus resilience, and collaborative risk management processes. We would like for all of you here today to be able to engage in our discussion. So my colleague Jesper is going to share a little bit more about how you can do that. Yes, hi everyone, hope you can uh, can hear me now. So we actually have uh, created a uh, just uh, en engagement uh, questionnaire using uh, our own tool actually so uh, we have created a uh, risk identification uh, questionnaire uh, using Inclus and what I really want you to do uh, here today or throughout uh, this uh, session so uh, think about the challenges and risks that you have observed or experienced related to uh, to risk management and uh, uh, here I have the instructions for the uh, for taking part in the, in the engagement form. Uh, if you are fast, you can uh, uh, try it out with the QR code using your mobile phone. But I'll also share the the link with you on in, in the chat uh, ju just uh, in a in a few seconds. And uh, when you access the uh, identification form, it uh, will look like this. Uh, so first, you can uh, briefly just read over the instructions, uh, give us your or choose a background uh, group. So if you are a risk management expert, or if you aren't directly working with uh, risk management. And then the idea is that you would here uh, go ahead and firstly see what uh, kind of suggestions and issues have uh, been raised here. So uh, you can then either uh, flag or upvote the issues that you feel that are uh, relevant uh, and that you have uh, discovered as well. And uh, then you can also comment on these existing uh, existing suggestions and issues uh, and then if you find that uh, some observations that you come to your mind uh, aren't listed yet so then you can add your own suggestions here as well and very easy way to uh, yeah give us your input on on risk related to risk management and we're looking forward to seeing what kind of results we'll we'll get here and uh, after uh, Mikael is and uh, Michael's discussion will uh, tap into the results here and uh, have a have a chat about about the uh, what what's come can come up here in the the form. And uh, great, uh, I'll now go ahead and stop my screen share and uh, share the the link to this uh, form so you are able to uh, check it out as well. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Jesper. And a um, couple of folks filtered in while you were talking. So for those of you who may have missed it, just look for some more information in the chat. We just want to make sure uh, everyone that's on the webinar today is able to engage in our discussion and we'll come back to it later uh, in the webinar. So with us today, we have Michael Rasmussen, an internationally recognized authority in governments, risk management and compliance with over 30 years of experience helping organizations enhance their GRC processes and stay ahead of the curve. And we are also joined by Mikaili Langin Vainio, our co-founder and CEO of Inclus. Mikaili brings an impressive track record of 20 years in risk management and peace mediation across complex global contexts. With his unique perspective, he offers practical insights on adapting to the changing risk management landscape and technological innovation in risk management. So welcome to both of you to our webinar. And 
To start us off, Michael, since you've been in the risk management scene for a long time, maybe you can tell us a bit about the current topics or most inter interesting trends that you're seeing right now. And, you know, meanwhile, give a little bit of background uh, on yourself at the same time. Sure. Uh, I'm Michael Rasmussen and uh, I'm an analyst. So I've got 30 years total experience and my background is a I have a business degree than a law degree, uh, but uh, um, I have as an analyst, that's 23 of my 30 years. Uh, before that, I did a lot of IT risk and uh, consulting back in the 90s. Uh, but uh, the 23 years as an analyst, I spent seven years at Forrester Research as one of their top analysts. And I guess my claim to fame is on a cold, snowy day in the Chicago office of Forrester Research. I defined and modeled the market and labeled it GRC, Governance, Risk Management and Compliance. Um, and and uh, so I've been called the father of GRC, the first to being the first to use that acronym. Um, spent seven years at Forrester and now 16 years competing against Gartner and Forrester. But my job is research. I spend my days understanding what are the challenges companies face in the context of governance, risk management, and compliance, and how do they go about solving those problems with strategy, process, and technology. So that's enough about me. But now, specifically, uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, you wanted me to discuss some of the, the trends and things that I'm seeing out there for risk management and compliance. Um, well, uh, I, I've <clears throat> labeled these tr five key trends in 2023. Um, and, and those trends are agility, resilience, uh, integrity, accountability, and engagement. Uh, now, I started off with agility as the number one trend because that's what organizations are looking for, but you can't really talk too much about the agility without addressing the resilience, the second one. So we'll start with number two before we get to number one. Uh, but so resilience is the first, tr uh, well, the second trend, but the, well, that's where we'll start. Uh, organizations need to be resilient and they're looking to be resilient. Uh, we've come through a lot the last three to four years, pandemics, uh, wars in, in, with Ukraine that, that drags in parts of Europe uh, to uh, global uh, in, inflation, economic uncertainty, supply chain disruptions and everything. Uh, we, we've had a lot of uncertainty uh, and uh, organizations are more and more focused on how do we be resilient. Resilience is the ability to recover from an event. You know, if I'm running down the street or on a, some type of trail, uh, and I trip over an obstacle, resilience is how quickly can I get back up and start running again? Minimize that downtime and exposure. That's resilience. It's that el elasticity, the ability to the, for a process, a business service, the business itself to spring back and recover. And, and so we ha have a huge focus on resilience. In fact, um, working with, the inner, uh, with a, a large global hospitality group, they're rebranding their risk and the risk management team to risk and resilience because they find that uh, the line of business and executives, they throw risk around like a hot potato. I mean, who wants to own risk? <laughs> you take this. I don't want this. Uh, but but they find that resilience, that's something the business can understand and, and it's something they desire. What business process owner doesn't want to be resilient? What executive doesn't want to be resilient? So uh, to get better risk acceptance, they're, they're pushing that through with this whole theme of resilience and that we need good risk management to be a resilient organization, have resilient processes to be able to identify risk events and issues and contain them before they become much bigger issues. And so resilience is a critical key theme right now. But that brings us to from number two to number one, the agility theme. Uh, organizations are moving beyond just resilience to want to be agile. What's coming at us? What's developing on the horizon six months from now? Well, what are the scenarios like scenario analysis and risk management where these factors of economic uncertainties and geopolitical risks and operational risks, how they all intersect and, and, and weave a, a potential story? And what are those variety of stories and outcomes? Uh, and, and how do they play out on the organization? Organizations are looking to be agility, uh, to, to, to be agile, to have agility, uh, and that requires very good, strong risk management capabilities to be able to identify our risks, not just the, the here and now risks, but the risks that are developing on the horizon and, and building out the scenarios and how those risks can play out and impact the organization. 
agility is the ability that if I'm running down that street again, remember for the resilience of my trip, you know, resilience is the ability to recover from an event. Uh, but uh, but uh, agility is the ability to see what's come, what's out there. Uh, but but if you go by the dictionary definition of resilience, uh, resilience is that elasticity, the ability to recover from an event. It's it's right there in the dictionary. Now, some of the re the uh, regulations out there, like the United Kingdom's Operation Resilience Regulations, it takes in this aspect of agility because it also talks about the ability to prevent an event, and that's what we're talking about. That agility. So resilience is the ability to to uh, recover or uh, go w withstand a risk a risk event. Agility is the ability to navigate the environment. And, and both are critically important. They're very symbiotic with each other. Organizations need to be agile and resilient, and they work together. They go hand in hand. Uh, and, and that's what good risk management delivers is both good risk agility and good resilience. And in that context, it also requires that we think not with just our left side of the brain, but also our right side of the brain. The left side of the brain is where a lot of risk management historically has been, you know, that mathematical, logical thinking on risk, uh, where we build our risk models and, uh, and, and, and mathematical structures on evaluating risk. And that's important, but models aren't perfect. They never accurately represent the real world. The real world has too many variables and inputs. And so we need just as strong right brain thinking on risk. Uh, that creative out, outside the box thinking, you know, what, what, where's this model not, what's it not telling me? Where can it go wrong? Uh, and so we need to bring both left brain and right brain thinking to uh, enable both the risk agility and the risk resilience and bring those together. Uh, so I talked about the first two trends and that's agility and resilience. The third trend is integrity. And that's all about ESG. Well, I shouldn't say it's all about, but the core of it's ESG, environmental social governance. Uh, and at the end of the day, your ESG commitments aren't about complying with checklists of laws and regulations and re compliance requirements. It's about your own values and ethics, your values on matters of the environment, your values on the matters of the social aspect, such as inclusivity, diversity, her, uh, um, child labor, forced labor, privacy, and issues on matters of the, of the governance of the organization, from transparency and beneficial ownership, internal controls uh, to security, to fraud, to anti-bribery and corruption. You know, uh, integrity is about what we communicate to the world that our values, our ethics, our ESG statements are. What we communicate to the world, that's a reality in the inside. It's actually what we live by. It's not just smoke and mirrors. And we see a huge focus on ESG right now. And, and uh, unfortunately, where I live in the United States, it, it's really fragmented. And, and a lot of people think like the SEC climate change uh, uh, rules that if are supposed to pass at some point, we'll see when, uh, that that's all about ESG. No, that's just a fraction of ESG. I mean, that, that doesn't even deal with all the E in, in, the, in ESG. That just deals with, cli with climate change. And, and that's a huge issue. I'm not downplaying that. But there's a lot more to the E, like PFAS and forever chemicals and air, water, waste, pollution and themes. The E is very much, much broader than climate change. Unfortunately, in the United States, everybody thinks ESG is all about climate change. Um, and, and and I shouldn't say everybody because I mean I live in the United States I don't think that way but but uh, unfortunately that, that that that's that perspective but in Europe you got much broader focus on ESG like with EU CSRD the the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive that impacts fifty thousand firms uh, the the now it's passed Parliament and going before the individual countries uh, the EU Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive uh, there there's a much broader focus on ESG. But integrity is extremely important. What we communicate to the world that our values, our, our commitments, our ethics, our practices, that it's a reality in the organization. So agility, resilience, integrity. The fourth one is accountability. And accountability is different from responsibility. Responsibilities I can give other people. I can take tasks and responsibilities and hand them off to someone else, to an employee, to a third party. Accountability, I can't. I own that. If there is a risk issue, I have to step up to that. I own that. Uh, and, and so we're seeing a huge focus on accountability. 
Well, we're, we're seeing this in the accountability regimes around the world, like you, the United Kingdom's SMCR, Senior Managers Regime and Certification Regime, Ireland's SEER, Senior Executive Accountability Regime, Hong Kong's Managers in Charge, Australia's what was BEAR, now FEAR, some say FAR, but the Financial Executive Accountability Regime, that's the best acronym for a regulation ever, the FEAR regulation. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the Singapore's Individual Accountability Conduct, South Africa, uh, you're seeing a huge focus in the United States from the U.S. Department of Justice uh, uh, on greater accountability for compliance. Um, you, you see New York, New York State and California putting greater focus on accountability of executives for risk and compliance. And you even have Uber's former chief information security officer being held liable for a security breach cover up. Uh, you know, greater, greater accountability. So we looked at uh, agility, resilience, integrity, accountability. The fifth one is engagement. Risk management just doesn't happen in the back office of risk management. No, a risk happens throughout the business. Executives are making risk decisions every day in the board. You know, the line managers and operational managers and project managers, they're making risk decisions every moment of the day that impact projects, impacts the business and operations and transactions. You know, those frontline employees, the doctor and nurse at a hospital, they're making patient safety and patient privacies every moment of the day. The coal miner in the coal miner mine is making environmental and health and safety decisions you know, throughout the day. Risk happens throughout the business and at the edge of the business and within the business. And we need better uh, technology and, and, and processes and information to be able to engage not just back office functions of risk management, but the first line, the front office that is engaging in risk uh, throughout uh, the day, every moment of the day. So those are the five trends I'm following. If, if I didn't confuse you, uh, agility, <laughs> resilience, integrity, accountability, and engagement. Thank you so much, Michael. That's really sets the scene for our discussion quite nicely. Um, I'm curious, Mikaeli, what what reactions you have to those themes, or what what themes are you also keeping an eye out for? Well, certainly those are the topics and themes that we are also bumping into every every now and then or almost constantly depending on the customer but um, i would say that in the big picture risk management itself has been uh, becoming uh, the topic on on many executive committees board uh, sort of discussions and, and audit committees and and risk management is taken more and more seriously and there's more and more focus on the on the on the frameworks and practices and policies and, and resourcing also consequently which is a good thing uh, but i think that the sort of digitalization of risk management function is is still uh, sort of uh, evolving uh, evolving sort of depending on the and the sector and the industry uh, differently of course but uh, let's say uh, we see a lot of outdated uh, outdated sort of practices when it comes to managing the risk management process itself but certainly sort of the uncertainties many companies are, are uh, sort of honestly explaining us how their risk management as a process has failed them in the strategic sense because they have not been able to sort of foresee the uncertainties in the political and security environment that we are ongoingly seeing to evolve and, and also taking more dire uh, developments and, and parts of uh, uh, sort of action when we're talking about Russia, Ukraine, China, Taiwan axis and, and other other areas also regional tension in other areas as well. AI is permeating the society constantly and changing the society as we know it probably in, in five to ten years. Uh, a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, environmental environmental impacts like like Michael also laid out uh, are having direct acute effects on global organizations and also the chronic uh, uncertainty where the uh, climate will go is is certainly uh, something that's worrying a lot of a lot about the com companies and 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 they feel that the the traditional risk management process is not fitting or or serving them well in foreseeing these more strategic level issues. And, and therefore, we see that there's need to, to sort of uh, raise the level of, 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 of monitoring, but also understanding the uh, mission environment with foresight tools and developing threat models and opportunities sort of models also in order to foresee the risk that needs to be actually addressed within those scenarios. But without these two processes talking to each other, uh, you are missing quite a lot of strategic level uh, changes. And as, as mentioned, it's about sort of resilience 
and to be resilient on what you don't necessarily always know and you just want to be resilient for taking hits so to say and and i would also maybe add another angle or it's not maybe an additional angle but it's sort of a add another formulation for resilience uh, and maybe combining the agility and resilience into into one sort of process or one or one description of, of of operating model is that resilience actually means uh, your ability to maneuver before your back breaks completely uh, and and to the to the point that you can't anymore uh, stand up when your back really breaks and and it's the sort of path to the absolute breakdown and how 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 well you can how agile you can be and how well you can maneuver while taking hits is also an important uh, part of resilience well, we if we think about Ukraine's current situation, uh, the whole Europe's sort of destiny is is dependent on on the resilience of Ukrainian society and military at the moment, and 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 when that breaks, then there will be uh, consequences that uh, are not necessarily foreseen uh, by by everybody currently, and of course we don't necessarily want to always uh, look at those most dangerous scenarios, but sometimes you have to ask yourself, is my worst case scenario bad enough? And and we need to have these uh, these processes in place where we actually prepare, but not only to the worst worst case, but the path to the worst case. And then we can sort of adjust uh, 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 our sort of mitigation measures and continue to plans based on our, our situational understanding as it's sort of evolving. Um, yeah, so those are some of the some of the topics. There's a lot of things that I want to tap into, but what Michael said, but uh, uh, those are sort of spontaneous first comments. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Miki. Um, I'm curious, Michael. So uh, Mikaeli discussed a bit about how um, how organizations can kind of transition from a traditional form of risk management and improve on their processes. And your point of the um, the engagement, to me, it sounded a lot like collaboration. So how can organizations get better at collaborating when it comes to risk management? Oh, well, collaboration requires good communication. And that can happen face to face and interaction like in, in physical risk workshops. But the the the, the hybrid workforce is scattered all over. So more and more, we need good technology to facilitate good collaboration, to be able to provide insights and see things from different perspectives and, and to uh, get other people's opinions and things. There's, I love doing risk workshops and, and I love being able to get different people. Now, you, there, there, there are things you have to be aware of that you can get some personality in a room that is a very strong personality. Maybe it's even an executive and everybody just sort of like does whatever that person says. And so there's a place to like have people provide input, even through like technology anonymously to say, you know, here's what I think our top risks are. Uh, instead of having one like very vocal person say, this is what it is. And everybody says, oh, that's right. Because because we get people to actually think for themselves, you get different perspectives. And it's all of a sudden, I didn't think of that. That That's an issue. Uh, and, and so... Um, uh, I, I think good collaboration and technology facilitates good collaboration and inputs. Um, I'm a, I, I'm a right brain thinker, so I, I love visual type aspects of risk management. So I, I love bow tie risk assessments, for example, because they're very much a visual. My my father was an accountant. My brother's an accountant. Um, I, my family's got some knack at math and, and I was OK, but I didn't like math. I, I love stories and words and uh, the liberal arts and everything. Uh, and so I, uh, um, I'm much more of a right brain risk thinker. And that's why I love bow tie risk assessments, because they're very visual and they help you think outside the box. Uh, but um, the but the so you you need good collaboration. Technology facilitates that collaboration. But the the other thing is is uh, on the downside, you can't be doing this with documents, spreadsheets, and emails. If you're managing documents, you're not managing risk. You know, uh, one firm that I talked to was spending 200 hours to build an annual report for the board of directors on all the risk events that have materialized in, in the organization. 
200 hours to build one risk report that wasn't available to them at a, in a dashboard or a push of a button. They had to go out across thousands of documents, spreadsheets, emails, aggregate, tabulate, build this report. They did this year after year. Every year took them about 200 hours to build. The last year they did it that way, they found out they had risk issues that started 11 months ago. We're out of control now. That's not managing risk. Not at all. That's reacting to risk at that point. Uh, um, a bank that I worked with, a mid-sized bank, they did an internal study of their risk management resources and found that 80% of their staff time is actually spent managing and chasing documents and not managing risk. Your managing documents are always behind the fact, behind the game, and not actually providing real-time insight into risk. And that's where technology provides that contextual insight where I can take in and see complex relationships of data and information on risk uh, and, and be able to report on it and, and mine it and query it in different ways. That's what's needed today. Absolutely, absolutely. We talk a lot with our customers about um, wanting to be on top of the risks rather than that being in that scenario um, where you're just constantly reacting. So I'm I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, Mikaeli, as someone who has developed this technology for risk management with the Inclus team, what are your reactions to that? There was certainly sort of collaboration. You always need to ask why we need collaboration or engagement. And, and first, first thought is, is that you need, of course, the stakeholders who should be responsible over mitigating and managing the risk to be committed really into the risk management process. That's for, for sure. And in order people to be committed, they need to engage their thinking left and right side, uh, right side of the brain, more creative and more reflective thinking on, on those risks so that they get actually intellectually stimulated to actually also act upon them and also understand what risk they are actually supposed to be mitigating. That's for sure. But then, of course, you want to be uh, you want to have as reliable reliable risk assessments as, as possible. And when we are doing basically assessment on the future developments, we uh, we don't know for sure. So so risk management is really an exact science. You you really can say exactly what is the impact or likelihood of a certain risk uh, realizing, and it's a rather uh, of of course depending on the available information and data sources, it's a fusion of intelligence. You have to fuse different kind of perspectives in to get to the close to truth assessment where you maybe can uh, get a sort of reliable assessment. But even though you would not necessarily uh, get a reliable assessment, you should understand how much uncertainty you have in that risk assessment. And therefore you need engagement and collaboration in order to understand what are the uncertainties behind this behind this risk and, and 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 therefore you need to sort of put maybe more resources to those risks where you don't necessarily have that strong understanding on because they are sort of extra extra uh, uh, dangerous sometimes it's said that those risks that you have little knowledge is is sort of worse than those that you have no knowledge because you act upon that like you would know what the risk is but you don't necessarily know uh, uh, but that's that's for sure one of the uh, aspects of collaboration that you 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 need to you need to consider. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. On the topic of technology, I'm wondering also if we can maybe think a little bit towards the future as well. Um, so, Michael, what do you see in in terms of technology and AI when it comes to the future of risk management? Technology and AI. Well, I mean, for, for one thing, uh, I've defined six generations of GRC technology. Uh, GRC 1.0 back in February 2002. Uh, unfortunately, I, I defined GRC broadly, but also Sarbanes-Oxley hit that year. Uh, and, and so was, I call it the Sarbanes-Oxley captivity of GRC. Uh, version 2.0 was enterprise GRC that really enabled these back office functions of risk compliance audit to work together. GRC 3.0 was this era of there's not one platform that does everything. There's a place for best of breed systems and be able to integrate with other content sources and information sources and things. So it's called GRC architecture. But then about seven, eight years ago, I was getting a lot of complaints uh, on legacy solutions in this space that were extremely expensive to implement. 
own, maintain, uh, that broke on upgrades. Uh, and so we entered the era of, and we, we continue this era of GRC 4.0 Agile GRC. Low code, no code solutions that are very intuitive, engaging, easy to use, you know, uh, like our host today, Inclus, you know, but, but being able to uh, modern technology, SaaS, cloud enabled technology. Um, and, and so that's GRC 4.0, Agile GRC. GRC 5.0 is built on that. Uh, and and so we're still we still have GRC 4.0, the agile cloud, low code, no code type solutions. But GRC 5.0 is cognitive GRC. How do we leverage artificial intelligence technologies? You know, natural language processing, machine learning, predictive analytics, uh, nat natural uh, um, uh, generative AI, and things like that for GRC. And also, how do we govern that as well? Um, and, and we're moving into the area of GRC 6.0, business integrated GRC, where GRC becomes less and less, you know, like these additional layers of complexity and bureaucracy and more baked into business processes. Uh, but, but, but cognitive GRC is a, is a big area and we're seeing a lot of advances like generative AI. I mean, we can't pick up a, any type of a trade journal news article without talking about, um, uh, you know, chat GPT, for example huge, huge benefits and potential benefits for the organizations, but also a lot of risk. Uh, and, you know, generative AI is not perfect. You know, I did a webinar on the UK consumer duty law in May, and, and uh, I did all my slides, prepared all of it. I said, let's just see what ChatGPT says. ChatGPT came up with some great points. It's like, you know, I should add that. I should add a slide on that. But it also got some things wrong, like compliance dates and things, and some things were backwards. You know, in the hands of a subject matter expert, generative AI can be very powerful as long as that subject matter expert's not lazy. Yeah, but uh, but uh, in the hands of a novice or inexperienced person, uh, generative AI can be very dangerous. Uh, and so the, the, there's there's good capabilities for it, but it needs to be governed properly. Uh, natural language processing, there's a lot of benefits for. Uh, you know, uh, like if you print off the United Kingdom's FCA rule book, it comes to a stack of paper six feet tall. If you print off the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations, it, it's longer than a marathon if you stack it end to end, you know, like 27 miles, however many kilometers, like 40 kilometers, whatever that is. You know, th that's a lot of paper. You know, if I had to read that and dissect that and, and categorize that, that, that'd be a very long project, take me a year or multiple years. A machine can take that massive amount of, of information and not only read it in like five to 10 minutes, but map it and, and categorize it. Uh, and I was talking to one chief ethics and compliance officer at a life sciences firm in Europe. They found that not only was natural language processing like a gazillion times faster at reading content, they actually found it 30% more accurate because I might, if I had a stack of paper to read, you know, this today, and, and it was like regulations and legal stuff and things, it might take me, you know, forever to read through it. And my mind's going to wander and, and, and think about what are we doing for dinner tonight? Where are we going on vacation and holiday this year? And I'm going to miss things. A machine's mind stays on task. So there's great benefits for cognitive <laughs> type computing, artificial intelligence, but there's also great risk. Absolutely. Uh, Mikhail, please tell us your thoughts on, on AI and risk management. Yeah, I love those that Michael brought up. Maybe a couple, couple more sort of lessons learned already using AI in, in risk management. Uh, it's true that you have to be careful when you're using the generative uh, aspect of, of AI if you don't control the data set that it uses or if you use the open AI data corpus where you don't necessarily have risk information there, but you have general language and knowledge, uh, which can be very useful uh, if you know how to manage it and how to give the prompts to the AI and use actually the AI for your, uh, for your purposes and also be cautious of using that data. Uh, but we just have to think about the risk management process step by step and think how AI can support us. So, so certainly it can help us to see the blind spots in our risk identification. And there it's important whether you ask the AI before you do the human thinking. So we should uh, consume our own brain power as, as, as you know, to the greatest extent that, that we can at a time, and then ask the AI to work on what we have missed, for example, because our, us as humans, we tend to anchor our own thinking to the first information that we get, and that first information might, might be from AI that, that it's not necessarily reliable. 
sort of mirroring effect or, or, or sort of preference bias or anchoring bias and so on. So we have to be careful on our own human biases when we work with AI, which can also have biases. So we can have double biases in, in, in that sense. Uh, but where it can also help is, is sort of the analysis of, of, of the risk data. Uh, when you're using the AI for summarization of, of a lot of data, qualitative and quantitative data, and there you control the data set that the AI uses, so then you use just the machine of the AI to actually uh, analyze your data. Uh, and of course, you can use your own risk registries and, and sort of taxonomies if you have built those uh, in order to sort of educate the AI further for your purposes. But now it's said that those libraries, uh, risk libraries and taxonomies are getting outdated because you don't need that because AI can actually on the fly uh, categorize data uh, in a very efficient manner and link different kind of risk topics and incidents to certain risks and, and it can be used uh, in, in that sort of uh, combining a predictive model as well. Uh, and, and, and that, that, that's certainly one. Uh, and then, of course, in the mitigation side, you can generate mitigation action plans to learn from the lessons of, of the previous projects, for example, and that kind of things. Uh, so AI can certainly help us in, in many ways, and we just have to know how to, how to command it in principle. Yes, exactly. And that takes us quite nicely to the next uh, section of our webinar, which Jesper will take over and share a bit about what you all in the audience have added to the system. Yes, hi again. So uh, let's see here on the uh, identification uh, questionnaire, what kind of results we were getting here throughout the, the first uh, part of the discussion. And uh, we can just go uh, briefly over this uh, the input over here and uh, before I saw that we had a bunch of uh, really good questions in the chat box as well. So before moving on to, to those questions, so maybe we can uh, just uh, highlight some of the uh, some of the input that we got here in the in the identification session. And uh, so here we see that the suggestions, so these are the, the new suggestions that has come from the from the audience here today. Then we can see the uh, the flag and the number here that indicates uh, how many how upvoted the uh, suggestion has ha has been. And here we can see that uh, lack of stakeholder en engagement is uh, uh, in addition to failing to identify relevant risks are are like the top uh, top issues here. So uh, I don't know, Julie, do you want to ask the speakers uh, uh, some questions regarding regarding this? Uh, before you go there, maybe you can so show how we could now utilize AI to further uh, uh, sort of brainstorm on those on those risks, and then yeah, we yeah, can definitely. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, let's uh, go ahead and and uh, jump uh, back here into into inclus. It's actually yeah, good that you pointed that out because we as we were just uh, talking about AI. So uh, actually, inclus we now have our first set of uh, AI features here as well. Uh, and in the identification uh, part of the risk process, risk management process, we actually have a uh, inclus AI button so we can uh, use AI to, uh, as Mikaeli said, so uh, identify blind spots in our own thinking and expand on our, for example, our existing risk register. So here we can see if we press the inclus AI, so we ask uh, uh, the AI to suggest additional uh, risks and it accounts for the uh, risk category, the description, and then the existing uh, risks here, and then we can see what kind of uh, suggestions we get from from the AI, and then we can easily just go ahead and and uh, click the ones that we feel are uh, relevant, and then we can add them to our uh, register here. So we can, for example, go and uh, select lack of risk ownership and inadequate uh, and failure to account for external factors, and then we can add them easily to our to our list here and then they can be then uh, uploaded as well and uh, this is an exercise that we can run how many times we uh, we, we want and uh, really exciting exciting new feature uh, in inclus yeah so this is now the generative part of inclus yeah. uh, ai which of course you have to be sort of cautious how to then uh, approve those AI suggestions, but you can always modify them in between of approving them uh, as suggestions from the AI. Yeah. But yeah, maybe maybe we move on to the questions and 
and yeah. support and more. Yeah. And then to add it just uh, briefly here. So after you've done this part, then of course you would move over to the uh, risk assessment side. So you would assess, for example, the likelihood and the impact of the identified risks. And from this, you would then get uh, some sort of a risk matrix and uh, report on the on the results here. So yeah, but yeah, back yeah. to the uh, results here that we uh, got from the uh, this uh, session. So take it away, Julie. Yeah, absolutely. So did anyone that um, contributed to this session have a thought on what they um, had contributed? Or if not, we could move just immediately to the, the Q&A. We also have some comments in the in the chat uh, in the teams. Yeah. Maybe we we go right to um, some of the comments in the uh, in the chat. Yeah. OK, um, so we'll just start with uh, the first question. We'll go down and if anyone else has um, additional questions, please feel free to raise your hand um, and and we'll call on you as well. But our first question comes from David, and he's asking Michael um, about the resilience that he, you had mentioned. So he says resilience is more than just springing back. It's about improving. So what is uh, the point of recovering quickly from tripping on a rock in your example um, if you're going to you know, fall over on more rocks later on? I, I absolutely agree. I, and and uh, that... Resilience is the ability to recover quickly, but it's also the ability to learn from uh, risk events and things too, and be able to uh, either avoid or mitigate future ones. And so, I mean, David's absolutely correct there uh, that, uh, you know, and that's how we, why we even have senses. We're all natural risk managers. You know, a child learns to that a stove is hot when that child touches the stove and burns themselves. <clears throat> and that child hopefully doesn't do that in the future uh, because the, there, there's a learning process to that. And that's all part of risk management. Uh, we are natural risk managers. And, and David's absolutely correct that, you know, when we trip, we should be more sensitive and watching the path before us. But as one of the later questions gets to that, we'll get to, you know, sometimes we have short lived memories as well. And so I mean, we might have tripped and maybe we're looking for obstacles for the next, you know, half hour. But then all of a sudden we become relaxed and all of a sudden we trip again. Uh, unfortunately, that happens as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And. Uh, we have another question here. So Yanni would like to hear more from Michael about how GRC is positioned as part of the risk uh, as part of the management system, and how risk management is positioned as part of GRC. Wow, a uh, great question. Uh, too often, what I see is G. And first off, let's look at the definition of GRC. Uh, the OSEG definition in the GRC capability model, which I helped contribute to, defines governance, risk, and compliance, GRC, as a capability to reliably achieve objectives. That's the governance function. They can be entity-level objectives, division, department, process, project objectives, uh, asset-level objectives. We have objectives. You know, governance is the setting, directing, and, and from there, eventually performing against those objectives. Uh, that And then we move to the address uncertainty. That's risk management. So GRC is a capability to reliably achieve objectives, governance, address uncertainty. That's risk management. Uh, ISO 31000 defines risk as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And so you have the relationship there. And the C is the act with integrity. So GRC is a capability to reliably achieve objectives, address uncer uncertainty, and act with integrity. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of programs are more CRG or CR or just C. Uh, we, we completely miss the objectives uh, and, and we start like with compliance and checklists and they're completely backwards. That's not good GRC. Good GRC is going to be baked into the business. It's going to be about those objectives. You know, I, I'm seeing software out there for like ESG, the environmental social governance, and it all starts with ESG risks. And I, I say that's backwards. It starts with ESG objectives. We have an objective to be carbon neutral. We have objective to have no child labor, forced labor in our supply chain. We have objectives to, to, to have no tolerance for bribery and corruption in our business. Then we can understand risks. 
ISO 31000 says risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. It, it, it all starts with the objectives, and that's a governance and management function is defining the objectives of the organization. Uh, and GRC should be baked in and start with that, but too often we put the cart before the horse. Uh, and and uh, we, we start with compliance or risks and we forget or we completely ignore any idea of objectives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on on that form, on the identification form, um, we had some suggestions that were related to also a failure to identify relevant risks. And I think it's kind of related to another question that was proposed in the chat. You know, sometimes we're we're behind on identifying the the risks, and we're we fail to identify the the right risks. So, um, Mickey, what would you say to that suggestion that was brought up? Yes, yeah, so certainly, that's a good question. Have we identified the relevant risks? Uh, is our risk list comprehensive enough? Is it sometimes too comprehensive, and then we don't really assess and mitigate them? How do we actually ensure that we have the re relevant risks at, 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 the, at the table? And that comes also a little bit to the bottom up and top down approach question, whether we need to have some uh, lessons learned based risks that we must must analyze, we must follow. And, and you can sort of tackle that problem often by thinking about the sort of root causes of those risks and co going up upwards to the abs abstraction level in the risk management process and not being that technical because in the technical level you have millions of risk at the end of the day and 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 sometimes we are sort of uh, having problem preferences so other people like to talk about technical stuff and they like to think about technical risks and they are very good at that but then they forget completely that human human related uh, risks which are out there of course always and and you need to get a balanced uh, group of people representing their own individual thinking before you go into the group thinking mode uh, which is often also one of the uh, basic biases where we start to sort of uh, you know uh, forming a group opinion without anybody asking us to do so so we should not be having a uniform idea thinking when we are thinking about risk we should have divergent thinking creative and and, and out of the box thinking and also of course depending on the process uh, how how uh, 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 sort of improbable risk we want to think but uh, at the end of the day we just did for example with OECD high level a risk forum, an emerging risk analysis where we looked at the low probability, high impact risk for the globe and what sort of risk we can see from there uh, uh, emerging, uh, for example, uncontrolled cyber attack vectors and, and, and what kind of impact those could have in a global uh, scene, uh, you know, super pathogens uh, releasing from the permafrost and etc cetera, etc cetera, sort of uh, global global events that could happen which are maybe low in likelihood for example the nuclear threat in uh, from russia it's not no prob no zero probability there is a probability and what what is that probability and is our preparedness sufficient for that probability even though it would be one uh, percent or two percent the impact of it is too high that I'm actually puzzled why our radiation authorities in any country, for example, haven't given any good guidance uh, uh, for the citizens. And, and of course, you need to do the strategic communication in a manner which is not causing alarmistic behavior, but rather actually preparing people for any scenario, which is actually giving you sense of security because you feel more in control, even in the sort of most uncontrollable uh, scenarios, but we always can prepare for everything. And I think that we should have, you know, specific sessions where we are looking at those low probability events and we are really thinking that if they would happen, what we would do. Absolutely. Michael, we had some suggestions come through also about insufficient resources um, and how, you know, interests and budget slowly fizzle out over time. Um, and I, I see that also being related to 
uh, engaging stakeholders who may not necessarily be engaged or interested in risk management. So what would you say to to that issue? Um, I mean, engagement is absolutely critical. We have to develop a culture that continuously nurtures this because people's memory often is short lived and, and uh, we forget and, and move on to other things and don't prioritize things. And so uh, we, we need to continuously engage and I mean, risk culture uh, and our ethical culture and um, our broader corporate culture, all these are interconnected, interrelated and build on each other. But we have to really nurture this. You know, culture can be destroyed overnight, but it can take years or even decades to repair a culture in an organization. And, and so we have to develop a culture of integrity and a culture of what's acceptable, and unacceptable risk and how we take and manage risks. You know, some organizations are aggressive in taking risks out there and, and they might even manage that risk so well that they get greater return and outpace their their competitors. Others might might be, you know, uh, less aggressive in taking risks, but they can completely fail because they're not taking risks and business is all about taking risk. You know, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the U.S. president, said risk is like fire. If controlled, it will help you. If uncontrolled, it will rise up and destroy you. Uh, J uh, John Paul Jones, he's a famous U.S. Revolutionary War naval hero. When you're fighting the British, what, 250 years ago, uh, I, I, he said he's known for the famous saying, I have not yet begun to fight. And he turned around and won a big naval battle. But he also said it is a law of nature, inflexible and inexorable, that those who do not risk do not win. Risk is part of war, uh, you know, as as Michaela was, was just saying, uh, but risk is also part of life. Risk is part of business. Uh, uh, and and uh, Judge Mervyn King from South Africa, he's the impetus for the Keen 1, 2, 3, and 4 reports on corporate governance. He said enterprise is the undertaking of risk for reward. Basically, businesses take risk to make money. You know, it's part of business. And we have to nurture that culture, and that means continuous engagement and making sure people are, are are keeping focused on these issues and not getting distracted and forgetting and becoming lazy in risk management. Absolutely. Great comment. And I, of course, seen seen also different cultures based on different different sectors. For example, healthcare sector don't want to take risks but they have to <laughs> and uh, also it's it's not an enterprise but there uh, it's risky business to try try to keep people disease free or healthy from 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 accidents and and so and so it's it's definitely uh, a sector where where everything is sort of a uh, sort of mitigated to the extreme but at the end of the day you you, you always have uh, the sense of crisis uh, in in hospitals for example and actually the Terminology crisis comes from the uh, from the health healthcare sector describing a condition of a human being when it's becoming uh, uh, sort of a, uh, or the that that becomes a, a imminent possibility then you are in a crisis uh, and, uh, and and sort of uh, also understand uh, that some sectors actually just inherently have have risks. And then other sectors uh, are taking risks when they are doing innovations and uh, uh, and investing into new technologies. For example, energy sector is now in the turbulence. Everybody wants to get into the into the latest technologies and and develop and find out the best ways of developing energy, and that requires huge investments, hundreds of millions and billions, even into a couple of test lab laboratories or, or, or sort of. Uh, Test sites and and so on. So uh, that that's that's a that's a sector where they're taking huge risks, but the reward is of course a, a, a great there as well. So th those are some generic thoughts. Yes, thank you. Are there any more questions? Please feel feel free to throw them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, we do have one more from Yanni, and he's asking Michael, "What are your what are the most important features for your dream GRC system?" Ah, uh, gosh, I mean that 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 some of that's going to vary by size of organization and by industry because the, the, what's needed for a large global bank in risk management is different from you know a small manufacturing company. 
Um, the, the, there's different risks. There's different uh, requirements and things like, you know, uh, capital modeling and things like that that you find within Basel for banking. And so it, the, there's a variance there. But but at the core, it, it, it to me, the, the, the critical thing is having the depth of functionality for the back office functions for risk management to really analyze and, and see the interconnectedness of risks as well. Um, uh, but uh, but also have the user interface and experience that can engage not only just those back office functions, but the front office from executives all the way to frontline employees. That's intuitive, easy to use, can be configured and adapt to the organization, with, you know, but a way where it doesn't break on upgrades. Uh, um, and and, and uh, so it's future proof there. Uh, those are all critical elements. Absolutely. We have another question from David. He's asking for us to open Pandora's box and uh, what market sectors will thrive and which will struggle in an increasingly AI and quantum world? Interesting question. <laughs> what was What was the question again? What market sectors will thrive and which will struggle in an increasingly AI and quantum world? That, that there's so much uncertainty in that because to me, I think across industries, there's businesses that can leverage AI very well to its advantage. And there's others that will in the same industry that can completely destroy itself because they're not, you know, as Judge Mervyn Keene said, enterprise is the undertaking of risk for reward or Teddy Roosevelt, as I mentioned, risk is like fire if controlled it will help you if uncontrolled will rise up and destroy you. So I, I, I mean, I think the question applies across industries. It's more the question, how are they leveraging AI and quantum, the risks, but also the benefits to be able to outpace their competition. Because within any industry right now and across industries, I think the quantum and AI can either uh, advance the organization or destroy the organization. Yeah, and I would add add uh, the the sectors. Um, that's that's a that's a big question because it's permeating all sectors, and we don't know yet. And AI will be part of every product and service without us knowing it probably in the few few, few next years even one of the big questions is uh, is when do we or do we see a super intelligence or uh, general ai that can actually then uh, actually self code and self evolve and and so on and we have of course these doom, doomsday scenarios also later on that which can be uh, i don't know possible uh, but uh, how I see it, it's it's more about the organizations who actually own the AI, which are having all the top power, and and who are able to utilize the AI within a particular sector will uh, gain such an competitive advantage that uh, that certainly uh, will disrupt uh, many markets. But uh, that's a that's a very good question, David. Perfect. Well, I think that that leaves us at time. Um, and I'll hand it over once again to Jesper um, to show us just a bit about how you can reach out um, to Mickey or Michael if you have any more questions uh, or anything else um, that you'd like to add to the discussion. And a big thank you from all of us. Thank you, Michael and Mickey, for joining us. And thank you all to all of our guests for coming today. Thank you so much, Michael. It's my pleasure. Yeah, th thanks for my part as well, and uh, such a such a nice and interesting uh, discussion. And thanks uh, all the, all the attendees for your for your input and, and uh, really good good questions as well. Uh, I now shared the uh, a link to a uh, feedback uh, re really uh, quick feedback form in the chat window, so feel free to uh, submit your feedback. Uh, and uh, I will send you send out uh, the recording for this webinar uh, probably to, during tomorrow, and uh, in that I will also add uh, add our contact details if you want. If you're interested, for example, in uh, in a quick demo on our AI features or the software in, in general.
All right. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.